Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, so this is um, work that I did uh, when I was at Barracuda with a few of my former colleagues. Um, so let me first set the stage. Um, so uh, business email compromise, BC, it has a lot of different names. Some people also call it spear phishing, uh, email social engineering. Um, basically, these are attacks that use uh, social impersonation as the main uh, vector of attack. So this is kind of a prototypical example of one of these emails. Um, so let's say you're, um, the attacker is impersonating Alice Smith, who is the CEO of a company, um, and the attacker um, spoofs the name of Alice Smith. They also send an email from an email address that looks a lot like Alice's corporate email address. So instead of acne.com, uh, they choose acne.com. Um, and of course, a lot of us don't, wouldn't uh, see the difference in an email client. Um, and the attacker is asking Bob, who's the CFO, who's under Alice, um, whether Bob can uh, wire transfer some money ASAP. And of course, this money is, uh, the goal here is to get that money out to a bank account owned by the attacker. Um, now, there's a lot of variants on this type of attack. So um, sometimes attackers you know, will try to fake the domain. Sometimes they won't even bother. They'll just send it from a random email address, um, assuming that people don't really notice the email address on their client. And then um, you know, wire transfers are kind of the most common objective, but they might also be trying to steal credentials or even PII, like uh, W2s, and so forth. Um, and uh, BC attacks are extremely lucrative. Um, so um, in fact, the FBI actually publishes an annual report just tracking BC. Um, in the last five years, there's been over $12 billion in losses reported to the FBI of people who've done mistaken wire transfers. Um, and this is actually a lot more than a, many other types of attacks um, that we all kind of have heard about. So for example, ransomware is only around $25 million a year, rough estimate uh, from Google. Um, so this is orders of magnitude more damaging uh, to organizations. Now, you might ask yourself, why don't existing systems uh, detect these attacks? Um, so there's really two reasons for that. Um, first one is BC attacks are highly targeted, right? So the attacker is actually manually crafting an email to a particular employee in the organization, a particular organization with, with some context, right? And so something like a spam filter will obviously won't, won't pick this up. In addition to that, the attack doesn't have any obviously malicious payloads, right? So often these emails are actually just plain text. They're just a piece of text. Um, and you know, they won't have any malware or viruses. And you know, even if they have a link, oftentimes that link has, um, is coming from a high reputation website and, and a zero day link. Now there's actually been um, some prior work uh, from academia, actually from <laughs> Grant and some of his uh, collaborators from two years ago at Usenix Security um, that tried to stop uh, this type of, of attack with a detector. Um, and they used an unsupervised uh, learning model. And they did a good job, they, they catch uh, the vast majority of attacks. But in terms of uh, false positive rates, um, they, have, they have very high false positive rates. So they kind of assumed that the organization using their system has a group of security analysts that can actually sift through the results of their system to say if they're good or not and then quarantine them. Um, and so um, at Barracuda, a lot of the customers and users really don't have you know, security analysts, a big security analyst team, or any security people at all. And so we tried to build an automated uh, system called BC Guard, which uh, was then incorporated in a commercial product called Barracuda Sentinel, uh, which had a very low false positive rate. So less than one in a million emails um, and a high precision of above 90%, which means that um, the system can automatically quarantine these emails for the customer and doesn't require an analyst. So how do you go about uh, building a high precision detector for such a, a targeted attack? So let me go through a couple of examples and show you kind of the hooks in these emails that we can then use to build a detector. So the first example is the same example I showed um, earlier. Um, and now we're just gonna separate the hooks in the emails, uh, in the email to the header and the body, okay? So let's look at this email. So on the header side, the obvious thing that's kind of weird here is we're getting an email address with an employee's name, but with an email address that is different from the normal corporate address. So that is obviously kind of, uh, uh, anomalous. Um, and then in the body, right, we have a bunch of things going on here, right? So we have some sensitive financial, you know, request, which might be a little off. 
And we also have some sense of urgency in the email because the attacker really wants the employee to respond to the email quickly before they realize you know, that it's, it's an attacker. Now let's look at another um, example. In this example, the attacker spoofs both the name of the employee um, and the email address. Um, so they're actually sending it with a from of Alice Smith with um, Alice's real um, kind of acme.com email address, but they have a reply to uh, which is different. And so the idea here is to compel the recipient to respond to the email and then be able to capture the response. Um, and so here, um, you know, the obvious thing that um, is anomalous in the header is this weird uh, reply to address that's different than the sender address, right? Most of us would typically not send an email with a reply to that's different than the sender. Um, and then the body, again, it has some kind of an urgent request. Now, um, the thing is, right, each one of these attributes on its own has a lot of um, use cases that are legitimate, that are not attacks. So for example, um, getting an email address, uh, an email with an email address that you've never seen before from a particular person um, actually has a lot of legitimate uses, right? So you know, there could be sporadic um, use of personal email, right? So especially in a university setting, for example, that would be very common. Or you could coincidentally have someone outside the company with an external sender name, with a, sorry, with a sender name that has the same name of someone inside the company, right? So that could also happen. Um, and even this reply to address um, has legitimate uh, corner cases. So services like LinkedIn and Salesforce often legitimately impersonate people because they wanna capture the response um, to the reply to. And also for the, from, uh, from the body perspective, right? You know, you getting an email with uh, urgent wire transfer could be normal, right? It could actually be a wire transfer that you need to do because you owe a vendor um, some money, right? So obviously, you know, um, emails just containing these phrases are not, you know, good enough to classify as attacks. So to summarize here, right, each one of these attributes on its own is not enough, but a combination of these attributes could possibly lead us to get a classifier that has high precision. So let me talk about how we actually build um, such a classifier. So the main problem um, in building this uh, uh, detector is that uh, BEC is an imbalanced problem. Um, and what that means is if you take 50,000 random emails in a company, um, at least in our data set, only one of them will be BEC. And what that means, and, and this is going to be true for a lot of other right, targeted uh, types of attacks. And what this means is um, we immediately kind of ruled out unsupervised learning because you know, something like unsupervised learning, let's say that does clustering, is probably not going to cluster a BEC attack as one of the main categories of emails, right? It's gonna choose many other categories first. So we chose supervised learning. But there's a couple of challenges if you want to, to use supervised learning. So one, how do you actually physically label like 100 million emails? Let's say if you want just 2,000 samples of attacks. Um, and the second challenge is how do you actually go about training on this data set? So for the first challenge, uh, what we did is kind of a divide and conquer uh, policy. So instead of trying to um, label kind of all the emails from the get-go, um, we actually labeled um, our data into two sets of classifiers. Um, so we first uh, uh, trained a classifier that just looks at the header, uh, which I'm gonna call the impersonation classifier. So it's trying to detect an impersonation of an employee just by looking at the header of the email. And then we uh, trained a set of classifiers that only look at the body, and we only apply them to emails that were categorized as impersonations by the header classifier. And so what we did, at least to develop the initial version of the detector, um, was we actually used kind of bulk labeling to train the impersonation classifier. So we tried to find all the emails that could possibly be impersonation, all these emails that have different reply to addresses, all these emails that have you know, relatively infrequent usage of a particular email address for, for a particular employee, and then use them to train the impersonation classifier, and then only the output of that used uh, for, to manually label for the body, for the content classifiers. So that took us from like 100 million emails to something like 50,000 emails, which is still a lot, but more manageable. Now let me go through some of the kind of key, so all, all the details are in the paper. I'll go through some of the key features that we use um, to train the detector. So on the uh, header side, the impersonation classifier, uh, two of the most important features were, um, the first one is the number of times um, the email address, the sender email address, appeared with a particular sender name in the past. So intuitively, if you get an email from you know, a colleague, but it's with an email address that you've never seen before, it's more likely to be a BEC attack. 
Now note that this feature, in order to calculate it for each incoming email, we have to have the history of how this person has communicated in the past within the organization. Um, another feature that proved actually really important is sender name popularity. So, you know, a, a pretty common name like Alice Smith is actually much more likely to have outside people with the same name. But if, you know, you, you have my name, Asaf Sedon, at least in the U.S., you're much less likely to, to get outside people colliding with your name. In terms of the content classifier, so we, we employed a bunch of different ones um, just for kind of manageability purposes. It was easier. Um, so uh, let me just briefly describe our text classifier. Um, so again, only looking at the body and the subject. So what we do is we take the raw text, uh, we pre-process it to so remove all stop words, um, email addresses, names, headers, footers, et cetera. And then we compute that uh, TFIDF of the phrases um, in the email. And so TFIDF is a measure of how, more, how much popular is a particular phrase, let's say in a BC email, compared to that phrase appearing in a random email in your data set. And so the table here on the right shows some of the, um, the, the top five most popular uh, two-word phrases um, in our data set. And you can see they're all related to some kind of urgency. All right, so now let's say you labeled all your data set. The question is, how do you actually go about training on it? So it turns out if you just naively try to train on a highly imbalanced data set, uh, what you'll typically get is a classifier that always guesses that the email is innocent, right? Because that classifier, since, since an innocent email is 50,000 times more likely than an attack, right, this classifier would actually get very high accuracy. It would get 99.998, right? Um, so there's a couple of possible solutions to this. We could either oversample the attacks or we can undersample the innocent emails. We preferred uh, to undersample the innocent emails. Um, first, it has better performance, so we train over thousands of innocent emails and attacks rather than hundreds of millions of emails. And two, um, it, this uh, prevents us kind of from biasing the data set with a relatively small number of attacks. Now, um, even just uh, kind of training, even, even if, so let's say you decide to um, train on a small number of innocent emails. Well, if you just uniformly sample from them, that also yields a classifier with low precision. Um, and the reason for that is you're likely to kind of miss an important example of an innocent email that will, will be important for your classifier. So in order to overcome that, what we did is we actually ran a clustering algorithm on the innocent emails um, with the feature, um, the feature set of the, of the uh, classifier. And then we proportionally sampled from each one of the clusters according to the number of samples that we need. So just to illustrate that, um, let's say we have only two features. So the first step is to run you know, clustering algorithm. Um, and so we map our innocent emails to these features. And then we proportionally sample randomly from each one of the clusters and use those samples to actually train the classifier. Now, one more important kind of design uh, uh, feature, which turned out to be kind of really important to us, was that um, you know, historically, email security systems are designed as filters. They basically sit between the external world, kind of the attacker, and the mail system. And they filter emails as they come in. But as I mentioned earlier, some of our features require access to historical information on how people in the organization you know, typically communicate. And so um, we designed um, a different architecture, kind of an API-based architecture, which, um, where instead of sitting in the mail flow, we actually sit outside of the mail flow, but talk to the APIs of uh, uh, cloud email providers like Office 365, which also provide us with historical um, email data. All right, so now let's see how, how we did. Um, so we used an evaluation uh, data set. Of, um, we we ran, got random samples of 200 million emails uh, from Barracuda customers from uh, June 2018. Um, this yielded uh, roughly uh, 4,000 attacks. And we split the training evaluation data set in half. Now, um, the first thing we did is we ran only the impersonation classifier on its own, so just the part that only looks at the header. And what you'll notice is we got you know, pretty bad uh, false positives, right? So one in 6,000 emails. That, that's you know, for our, our data set, like uh, large organizations could get a million emails a day. So that, that's pretty bad. Um, and the precision is also uh, quite low, 12%. Um, so that kind of led us to the conclusion that just looking at the headers is probably not good enough, right? We're probably not going to get uh, high enough precision. 
But then when we combine the um, header classifiers and the body classifiers, we get kind of our target uh, uh, false positive rate and precision. So we're able to get um, on this data set, um, you know, more than uh, one in five million emails is less than one in five million emails is false positives, and above 98% uh, precision. Um, and so, kind of, if you compare that to kind of prior work, I think the two really key, um, uh, the, the two key things that we leveraged are one, the fact that we had access to the bodies, and two, supervised learning in this case allows us to get, you know, much much higher precision. But of course, supervised learning also has downsides, right? So we might be introducing biases um, into um, the way we train our data. Um, so fortunately, since you know, this, um, this ended up getting um, uh, rolled out into a commercial product, we actually have live users that can report attacks to us in real time. Um, and so what we did is we, took, we kind of uh, did a, uh, a small study where we took all the users that reported miss attacks and we kind of analyzed their results. And so we saw, so we t uh, chose five uh, random organizations from within the users that reported missed attacks to us. Um, and for those organizations, um, during this uh, time period, uh, we're able to uh, detect 60 true positives, but we missed uh, uh, five emails. Um, um, later iterations of the classifiers were able to fix um, uh, three of these uh, five attacks and were able to detect uh, similar ones. So, um, so to summarize, um, BC is a highly targeted problem, a highly targeted attack. A lot of the attacks we face today are such attacks, and so it's going to be imbalanced. And so, um, in in order to get um, high precision for imbalanced problems, we oftentimes need to kind of carefully apply uh, supervised learning. So, thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Questions. Well, it's coming up, I have a question. How, can you talk about how you did the clustering for, um, uh, to get the benign data for training? Like, did, like was it k-means or some other yeah, so clustering I, so algorithm? Yeah, so in fact, it doesn't really matter which uh, clustering algorithm you use. Um, yeah, so k-means would be uh, perfectly fine. Um, you just want to make sure that your clusters aren't you know, too small, right? So we chose a, uh, the number of clusters up to a point where the clusters became you know, ridiculously small, so let's say less than uh, a few emails. Um, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. And, and I really like that clustering method to deal with that, uh, with that sampling thing. And I fully agree that the details of the clustering algorithm, if they mattered, then something's wrong. Um, I just wanted to know. Uh, how easy it will be for attackers to adapt their content. Right. Uh, because right now, you've got a lot on that, and that is under attacker control. Of course, yeah. So, so first of all, we have a whole, so I, I didn't get time to talk about evasions, um, but so we have a whole section on that on the paper. Um, and so I also, just as a disclaimer, this is an evolutionary process, right? So I mean, unfortunately, when you're dealing with uh, supervised learning or text-based attacks, you can't have something that's going to guarantee that you catch all future attacks. Um, but we do try to you know, make it relatively generalizable. So um, for example, the text-based classifier uses a relatively large dictionary. Um, so that's one, one thing um, you know, we're potentially looking at incorporating like, um, you know, deep learning uh, based techniques to make it even more robust. Um, the only problem there is that the text and emails is very sparse, um, so you need a lot of samples to train deep learning. Um, 